Good morning guys welcome back to the channel and it's Jennifer aka Jen Jen it's a dreary day here today it is been raining all night long and um, right now it's not raining and the temperature is dropping so it's kind of you know getting to the point where I you know as you guys know I asked, said yesterday what happened to the fall weather well guess what it's here thank God because I um, I uh, I want my fall weather. Let's put it that way. So we are going to get into this case, and I'm going to tell you guys about this case. And well, let's get started. And I'm going to dye my paint while we do that. So um, I know you guys probably remember this because this is one of the biggest stories that was out all over the country. Um, it was the DC sniper case, and they never could you know and I can remember they the when the shooting started nobody knew you know where the shot was coming from nobody could um, figure out who was doing it it took them you know a while to figure out who it was and one of the ones that is responsible actually he's the main person that responsible there were two and so the the main uh, person in this is John Allen Williams who also later goes by John Allen Muhammad and um, then of course there is Lee Boyd Malvo who was uh, 17 years old and um, now Muhammad was born in Baton Rouge Louisiana and then his parents moved to New Orleans where shortly after his mother was diagnosed with breast cancer and she died when he was three years old and so shortly after her mo his mother died his father left and he was raised by his maternal was it maternal grandfather and an aunt until he was 17 years or till he was let me see how old was he until 1978 where he enlisted in the Louisiana National Army National Guard in Baton Rouge as a combat engineer now I'm going to stop there. I'm going to go into his back life and, you know, his early life to lead up to how, you know, he, to the point where he, you know, was the one that was arrested for these things. Um, he then transferred to regular army in, 19, in November of 1985 and was trained as a mechanic and a truck driver and a specialist metal worker and he also qualified with the army standard rifle of the m16 and earning he earned the expert rifleman's badge and this is the army's highest of three levels of basic rifle mark marksmanship for a soldier so obviously he knew how to shoot a gun and he knew what he was doing. So then, um, so then he did his first tour at Fort Lewis in 1985. Then in 1991, he served in the Gulf War and he was with a company that dismantled Iraqi chemical warfare rockets and for that, he received the Southwest Asia Service Medal, the Kuwait Liberation Medal from Saudi Arabia, and the Kuwait Liberation Medal from Kuwait. In 1992, he was then at Fort Ord in California, and in 93, he ended up back at Fort Lewis, and he was d then April 24th, of 94 he was dishonorably discharged 
or no, excuse me, was honorably discharged from the army with the rank of sergeant after 17 years of service. And he received these awards during his 17 years of service. The Army Service Medal, the National Defense Service Medal, the Overseas Ribbon, the uh, Non-Commissioned Officers Personnel, Professional, excuse me, Non-Commissioned Officers Professional Development Ribbon, that's a lot of words, and the Army Achievement Medal. So this man was a decorated, you know, military officer before, you know, obviously he decided to, you know, commit all these crimes. Then now, apparently, now all during all this, he is married. Um, he's married, and I can't remember what her name is. Um... I'm trying to get to that. Okay, now he does ma he is married. He does get married to Mildred Muhammad. And she was his second ex-wife and she eventually filed a restraining order uh alleging abuse and he was arrested on federal charges of violating the restraining order by possessing a weapon. Now, I didn't understand how, you know, he could be arrested for that, but apparently under federal law, if, you know, you have those with restraining orders, they're prohibited from purchasing a, or purchasing or possessing guns, and, um, so he was arrested for that. Now, when he, in 1987... And we're kind of going to skip around here because it, you know, it's kind of, I wish they put these, sometimes I wish they put these things in chronological order, but they don't really, they, they have you skipping all over the place. But in 1987, when Muhammad was 27 years old, he joined the Nation of Islam and he helped provide security for the Million Man March in 1995. And then eventually the leader of the Nation of Islam had publicly distanced himself from Malvo, or excuse me, from Muhammad because of his crimes. So apparently, you know, as you will find out, he does commit crimes during all of this. And, um, sorry, I thought my daughter was, um, was um messaging me so again just you know obviously he's had he's committed crimes before that you know maybe we don't know about so in 2001 um <clears throat> or excuse me then Mohammed after he had been basically shunned by the nation nation of Islam Muhammad kidnapped his three children and ended up in Antigua, Jamaica, where he met Lee Boyd Malvo, but he didn't meet him right away. He became, uh, Muhammad became um, engaged in credit card and immigration fraud, and that is how he became, basically that's how, you know, he met Malvo. Now, in all of this, I'm assuming the children did go back home. So, in 2001, he changed his name from Williams to John Allen Muhammad. And, of course, when he was arrested, he claimed that he admitted that he admired and modeled himself after Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda and that he approved of the September 11 attacks in 2001 against us. Now, I don't know if he was considered an extremist. I don't know. And, of course, now, 
mind you now, remember, Ma Malvo is with him by this time. So, after they're arrested, Malvo later testifies and later tells everybody that he um, indoctrinated him into believing that these proceeds that he was trying to extort from the government would be used to establish a camp in Canada where homeless children would be trained as terrorists. So this guy just, yeah. this, I don't know what the, you know, I, I mean, I don't, I, I don't understand why, you know, he felt that, you know, that would, the killing people would give him the money. It, to me, that just, I, I'm still trying to understand all that. Um, now, uh, la, 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 la. Now, his, the defense attorneys in his trial argued that the ultimate goal for, you know, why he, the ultimate goal for the Beltway Sniper was to eventually, um, was to eventually kill M Mildred in order to regain custody of his children. So, and I do, and if I'm not mistaken, she did live over on the western shore because I'm in Maryland so I'm assuming um, that she did live there at the time I don't really know it does not I, I can't remember I've seen an interview with her but I don't remember if she was living you know here in Maryland at the time or you know what exactly you know now to now remember you know during he's been doing all of this he's you know committing this you know these you know he's killing all these people and in 2001 and are around there so then they follow a lead that uh they had obtained the police had obtained and that where either a Malvo or Muhammad had left a note at one of the shootings telling the police to investigate a um, liquor store robbery slash murder that had occurred in Montgomery, Alabama. So now, okay, so now they go to look at that case. They find a um, magazine that had fingerprints on it and they were identified as Malvo's. So, my thing is, did they intentionally, you know, make sure that, you know, he touched the magazine so that they would, you know, event, is that what Muhammad wanted them to do was to figure it out, you know, I'm not quite sure what his thinking is and why he told them to do that. The only thing I can think of is, again, that they wanted, you know, this was the, their way of saying, you know, you want to know who, who's doing this, you know, go and get this magazine. But see, then again, they don't even, they don't even really find out that it's um, Muhammad until after... They get Malvo's fingerprints and find out that, you know, he's associated with Muhammad and that they had lived together for a whole year in Tacoma, Washington, and where um, Malvo was using an alias in Tacoma. Uh, as John Lee Malvo. So, he's using the same name, same first name, and same middle name, or same first name as, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> as Muhammad. And that just kind of, 
is, you know, kind of weird. Um, now, his identification led to the discovery that he had purchased a former police car, a blue Chevy Caprice, in New Jersey in September the 11th of 2002. So, they figured out who he was, and, you know, they, they know what the car looks like. And what I've always wondered is, you know, and how they make the trunk that, I, I don't know. So, now, they know what kind of car he has. They, you know, they just know what to look for. Now, if I'm not mistaken, there were a couple of cars that looked, you know, almost like this. So, you know, which, of course, you know, probably when you get, you know, this kind of thing, you're going to get a couple of cars that are probably the same, the make, model, and same year. So, it's going to be, you know, just the the task of narrowing down which one's whose because, um, yeah, that's, you know, kind of obvious. Um, now, a lookout broadcast to the public was put out um, on the vehicle and it resulted in the arrest of both Ma Muhammad and Malvo and they were at a, re they were parked at a rest stop at Interstate 70 in Myersville, Maryland. And um not I don't I can't remember if they were asleep or and I remember seeing the the seeing this on the news and I can't remember if they were asleep in the car or if they were parked a certain, you know, certain way to you know, get ready to shoot the next person. I can't remember because that was a really long time ago. That was like 18, 19 years ago. So you got to realize I don't remember all this information. Um, so when he was captured in Maryland, and now this was done in April, uh, August 2000, uh, August, excuse me, October the 24th, 2002 is when he was captured, where most of these attacks took place. So he, it, sa it sounded like to me he focused more on Maryland and on, than anywhere else. So, um, and I think he kind of, they kind of slipped up because obviously, you know, if he was seen, um, if he was seen somewhere, then obviously, you know, um, now, Maryland sought to bring him to trial, but a, the, the United States Attorney General assigned, um, the case to the Commonwealth of Virginia to Prince William County. Now, why they did that, I'm not really sure. I do know that he did convict, um, um, that he did, uh, you know, commit some of the killings there. And the only thing I could think of is that they were most likely to impose a death sentence, which was borne out by Virginia and Maryland. And it also... Virginia also allowed the death penalty for juveniles. So I'm assuming because of, you know, one of the factors was that, you know, Malvo at the time was 17. So because he wasn't yet adult, an adult, they considered, you know, okay, we're going to send this to Virginia because they allow for, you know, a juveniles to get the death penalty. So then, um, 2003 in October, he, uh, Muhammad went to trial for the murder of Dean Myers, which happened around Manassas, Virginia. And the trial had been moved 
from Prince William County to Virginia Beach. And now they don't say why it was moved there. I'm assuming because maybe because of all the media coverage from here and all the, you know, media coverage from that side of the, you know, the state. I'm not really sure. So, um, he, Muhammad requested to defend himself, to basically represent himself. And, you know, they granted that. Now, shortly after that, they, they, um, he switched back to having someone represent him. The only reason is because when he went to do his opening argument in court, something must have been said that, you know, he felt or they felt that, you know, Muhammad needed to have legal representation. I don't know if it's because, you know, he went off onto this little speech. I, I don't know. So, you know, he's got an actual lawyer now. He was charged with murder, terrorism, conspiracy, and the illegal use of a firearm and faced with a possible death sentence. So he's, he's not going to get out of this. Now... We get to the gist of the reason of the killings besides the fact that, you know, he, the prosecution's already said his main goal was to, you know, kill his ex-wife to get his three children back. Now, they get to the, they get to the, the whole gist of it. You know, remember they, their Malvo had said something about, you know, extortion. He wanted to there was a plot to extort $10 million from local and state governments and that the prosecution said that they could make a case for 16 shootings that involved Muhammad. Now, whether that now involved how, I don't know if that means that, you know, he, you know, was one of the people that shot. Obviously he was, but, um, so... The terrorism charge against him required the prosecutors to prove that over a three-year period, he had did at least commit two of the shootings. And they called more than 130 witnesses. Um, they had 400 pieces of evidence that would intend to prove that Muhammad undertook these murders and that he ordered um, Malvo to to carry it out. The evidence did include a rifle. It did include um, that was linked to eight of the ten killings in the Washington area, and there were two others in Louisiana and Alabama. So again, he didn't just start this in D.C. I didn't know that myself. I When I read this the other day, I was like, really? I did not know that. I did not know he had done all this other stuff in Washington State and in, D in um, um, Louisiana. I had no clue. Um, da -da 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 -da. They also found um, in the, the car, the trunk was modified so that a sniper could look could shoot from the inside of the trunk and there was a laptop computer that had a map of that had a map that contained um that had icons of sh of the shootings of the shooting scenes so this these guys were keeping track of you know the shootings and the killings that they did and then um One of the witnesses put Muhammad across the street from one shooting and then his car near several others. Now, there was also a recorded phone call to police, to a police hotline. He called a police hotline and he identified 
himself and he had he demanded money or in exchange for stopping the shootings so that's the only way he was going to stop is if you know he got this 10 million dollars to stop the shootings now why he wanted 10 million dollars the only thing that they could come up with was that you know he wanted to start this camp and that's what he was going to use the 10 million dollars for that's the only um thing that they could uh come up with and um so now the witness the the defense attorneys asked them to drop the charge asked them to drop the uh capital murder charge because they said that you know there was no direct evidence to prove that Muhammad had con was con that he had no direct evidence that Malvo's fingerprints were the ones that were on the rifle and in Muhammad's car. Now they did find that DNA was from Muhammad was found on the rifle. So he couldn't get off of that one. They weren't going to let him off on that one even though, you know, they the defense is saying, you know, Malvo did this. And now why they're trying to make Malvo out to be the scapegoat and all this, granted, no, this child probably was not, you know, this child was, you know, probably just as guilty and so forth. But their Muhammad's attorneys are making it out to be that Malvo is the one that did all this and Muhammad wasn't involved. Which I thought was just kind of, you know, kind of messed up because, you know, they're both together. He's the one that took this child in and kind of, you know, took him under his wing. And he's letting his attorneys basically say, you know, Malvo did this. I didn't do anything. I was, you know, clueless. So that, to, to me, you know, I don't. I don't know why they did that that way. I don't know why, you know, Muhammad didn't stop it unless that was part of Muhammad's, you know, plan. I really don't know. No, nobody's, you know, nobody knows for sure. So, they claim that he could, that he could not be put to death under Virginia's trigger law man, trigger man law unless he actually pulled the trigger. And nobody testified that they saw him pull the trigger that killed um, Dean Myers. Then, um, now, then in 2003, in November, he was convicted on all four counts of the indictment against him. Capital murder for shooting Myers. Capital murder under Virginia's anti-terrorism statute for homicide committed with the intent to terrorize the government or the public at large. That's a long thing. Um, then, conspiracy to commit murder and the illegal use of a firearm. And in the penalty phase, the jury, after five hours of deliberation over two days, came back and recommended that Muhammad be sentenced to death in, on sentenced to death on March 20 or March 9th 2004 the Virginia judge agreed and sentenced him to death then um and to the, 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 I'm, I'm trying to read all this at one time is I'm, I'm I'm going way my eyes are going faster than my mouth on 2000 in April 2005 they affirmed his death penalty and his death penalty phase and stating that Muhammad would be sentenced to death because the murder was part of an act of terrorism. The court also rejected the argument stating that um, he could not be sentenced to death because he was not the trigger man for the killings. And the court justice at the time that, you know, that his defense attorneys were trying to do this basically said, and I'll quote, 
with calcul Muhammad with calculation and extensive planning, premeditation, and ruthless disregard for life, carried out his cruel scheme of terror. So, yeah, they didn't get away with, you know, the, 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 his defense attorneys lost that one big time. So then in 2005, in May, they, uh, Maryland and Virginia reached an agreement to allow his, extra, his extradition to face Maryland charges. He was held at, in prison near, Virgin, near Waverly, Virginia, and while awaiting trial, or while awaiting execution in Virginia, he was uh, extradited to Montgomery County, Maryland, to face charges there. So regardless, this guy was not getting out of jail. He was not getting out of this. And now, I don't remember how many people, you know, he shot. There was a lot of people. I can remember, you know, listening to this stuff on the news. And let me tell you, there was a lot of people that they shot. Uh, da, 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 da. On May 2006, the Maryland jury found Muhammad guilty of six counts of murder. He was sentenced to six consecutive life terms without the possibility of parole. And now, this is interesting. I didn't know that he committed crimes in all these other states until I was reading this, reading down and reading farther. It was kind of like, oh, okay. You know, because, I mean, you got to realize, too, when this all started in D.C., nobody knew who this man was. Nobody knew anything about him. You didn't know who he was. You didn't realize, you know, until you go to court and he goes to court. Oh, yeah, this guy's done all this stuff before, but, you know, killed other people before. And, you know, okay. So... Mind you, he was found guilty in Maryland and Virginia. Now, neither Alabama, Alabama, Arizona, Louisiana, or Washington State moved to try him because he already has a death sentence for murder in Virginia. Now, Malvo, later on in 2006, confessed that the pair also killed 14 victims in California, Arizona, and Texas. So, they've been doing this crap for a while. So then, um, now, I guess the whole time, Muhammad, you know, thinks, I guess, you know, I don't know what he was thinking, but, this is just a quote, and I, you know, again, you know, obviously they real, you know, he did this and so forth. But in 2008, uh, in May of 2008, he did ask prosecutors in a letter to help him end legal appeals of his conviction and death sentence. And the quote, and this is him, his words, not mine, I'm quoting him. So that you can murder this innocent black man. An appeal was then filed by Muhammad's, uh, no, excuse me, an appeal filed by Muhammad's defense attorneys in April of that same year had um, cited evidence of brain damage and that Muhammad was incompetent to make legal decisions and that he should not be allowed to represent himself at his trial in Virginia. So, um, okay, a question here, guys. It, my thing is, is if he had brain damage and they just now realize this, why didn't they figure that out beforehand when they arrested him? See, that's what I'm trying to understand. You know, why wait until... 2008, you know, six years later, and I'm really, really confused. I, I, I of course, you know, I, they probably had some kind of a plan 
for, you know, bringing this out at some point. But again, why wait, you know, six years after you are arrested and it come out now, then? It, it just, I don't understand that. I don't get that. that process now he was put um mm. now he did eventually now this is kind of interesting and i didn't know this either he did have a petition to review his sentence and it made it all the way to the supreme court and they denied his um They denied his uh, his petition, and they were stating that Virginia's rush to set an execution date highlights once again the perversity of executing inmates before their appeals process has been fully concluded. And they just, even though they concurred that the death sentence should not, um, that the decision for the appeal would not be heard. So, you know, I, you know, I get, you know, and of course, you know, again, that's their right to do this. Now, we're going to get into the Lee Boy Malvo's testimony and all of this. And, you know, I did see some of his testimony on TV and it, it was kind of, it was kind of strange and interesting because, you know, he sits there and he He's so trained that he only talked and only answered when he was spoken to. Basically, I mean, of course, you know, he's, he's sitting in, in on trial, and of course, you know, when he's quest when he's being a you know questioned on the stand, obviously, you know, okay. But um, in his two thousand and six trial in May, he was uh, sentenced to a um term of life without parole and um, after extensive psychological counseling uh, they he admitted that he was lying at the trial in Virginia the earlier trial in Virginia when he admitted to being trigger man for every shooting and his reason for doing so was he claimed that he had done this to try to save Muhammad from a potential death sentence. And that as he, Malvo, was a minor, he would not face the death penalty. And there were two days of testimony where he outlined the... Um, the aspects of this shooting and part of that was you know the complete plan there were three phases to this plan in DC and Baltimore areas phase one consisted of now this is just kind of you know bizarre basically um, consisted of meticulously planning mapping and practicing their locations around the DC areas and Baltimore area after each shooting so that they could quickly leave on a predetermined path and continue to the next shooting and Muhammad's goal for phase one was that um, he was to kill six white people a day for 30 days 180 per month that's a lot of people it doesn't, you know, I don't care if they were white, black, whatever, but obviously he did. I don't, you know, again, I don't know what that has to do with, you know, the whole, you know, thing. I'm, like I said, I don't understand this and I didn't understand it when I was, uh, when this was on the news. I just didn't understand his thinking 
as to why he was committing these crimes because, I mean, truthfully, you know, it probably made sense to him, you know, but to me, it really, I, it didn't make sense to me. But then again, so now phase two, oh, I meant, now Malvo told them that phase one didn't go as planned because of traffic, heavy traffic, and there was a lack of a clear shot and lack of getaway routes at the different locations. Now, I don't remember when, you know, these, the time of day that these took place. I'm thinking it was the rush hour. I can't remember um, because, I mean, it was a while ago and I don't really remember. Phase two was meant to be undertaken in Baltimore, and but that was never carried out. Now, this consisted, and this just kind of made my stomach gurgle, crawl, whatever. This consisted of killing a pregnant woman by being shot to the abdomen. The next step was then to have been the killing of a Baltimore uh, City Police officer. And then at the officer's funeral, that they were going to... Uh, detonate several improvised explosive devices with that contained shrapnel and that would eventually, you know, it be intended to kill a large number of police officers attending the funeral. Okay. I mean, th I have to give this guy credit. You know, I'm not condoning what he did. But, you know, he really really playing this stuff out um so then hold on i gotta i got to put this where this belongs so then phase three which was supposed to take place either after phase two or during phase two was to extort several million dollars from the united states government and this money would be used to finance um, larger finance a larger plan where um, he would travel to Canada, stopping you know on the way to Canada to YMCA's and orphanages to recruit impressionable young boys with no parents or any kind of guidance whatsoever and train them or no I'm sorry he thought he could act as the father figure and as he had with uh, Malvo and um, once he recruited a large number of young boys and had would arrive in Canada, Muhammad would train these boys to um, it would train them with weapons and then send them across the United States to carry out uh, mass shootings in a lot of different cities, just as he had done in Washington and in Baltimore. So, you know, this guy really had a big, huge plan. And, you know, they plan this out you know and that's what i'm saying it was very very like a meticulous plan but the last two plans the last two phases didn't happen and the only reason that i can think that it didn't happen was because you know they ended up getting caught so now um muhammad his scheduled ex uh, 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 on November the 10th, 2009, before Muhammad's um, execution, he pleads for clemency through his attorneys, which were basically denied by the governor of Virginia. And um, under law, an inmate is allowed to choose the method of which he is he or she will be put to death which is either lethal injection or electric um, ele yeah 
electrocution. And he denied to he denied to select either one of these methods. So because he because he did not select a method by Virginia state law, he they were allowed to go ahead and select it for him and they selected lethal injection. And they also gave him a chance to make a or excuse me. He was given his last meal which you guys can probably tell me what kind of dish this is, but he was given chicken and red sauce, which I do not know what that is, not unless it's supposed to be spaghetti sauce. I don't know. And then some cakes. Now, when it came time to for his, you know, to start his execution, which was at 9 p.m., um he declined to make a final statement and his body was then uh, of course then you know he the actual lethal injection process started at 906 and by 911 um eastern time he was pronounced dead he was cremated and then he was sent to um were given the they were given to his son in Louisiana. So he, you know, he did try to get away with this and kind of and to me it sounds like he did kind of try to pin it on Malvo, which now I don't know if that was, you know, his idea or if it was the lawyer, you know, his defense lawyer. It, it doesn't really get into that, but there were even rumors during all of this that um, he uh, molested Malvo at some point. Now, it I don't didn't see anything about that. I looked that up, and I did not. I remember reading, you know, but they he claims it, but there's nothing to like back that up. So I'm not really sure if. You know that was even true so yeah so that's that case guys and there is there are now I did not know this until I was uh, looking this up and I I had no clue now you know how they make movies out of almost everything you come up they, they do they make movies for these things um there was a movie made in 2003 called The DC Sniper 23 Days of Fear. Then one made in 2013 just called The DC Sniper. And then 2013 there was a film called The Blue Caprice. So there's like one, two, three movies about this man about, you know, what he did. I just thought that was just kind of like, uh-huh, okay, whatever you say. So, um, now, Malvo, I don't know if he, um, doesn't say, doesn't say what happened to him. Mm. Um, um. Uh, Let's see. Hold on, I'm trying to see if I can find out if he, you know. I mean, obviously he's in jail and he's been convicted. But, um, he, uh, it doesn't say what he, um, what happened to him. Or, you know, anything about, you know, what, um, about, um, about, um, him going to jail or, well, I mean, obviously he's in jail, but it doesn't say, um, 
what, um, you know, how long he is supposed to be in jail. Let me see. Let me find out. Um, he's got life without parole, but it was reduced to life. So, um, he, uh, as far as I know, he is still in jail. So, yeah, he's, he's still in jail. Sorry, guys, I was trying to find it. So, guys, that's it. I hope you all enjoyed this. And one, of, and I'm just going to tell you, one of the reasons that I picked this is, um, I, you know, remember this, uh, I live in Maryland, so I remember, you know, when this was all happening, and again, you know, at the time when this was going on, you know, you didn't know, you know, who was doing the shooting, you didn't know where the shots were coming from, and, um, but it always took place around the Beltway, and, it's just kind of, it was just kind of one of those things where you're sitting on the seat of your pants because, you know, you don't know. And <coughs> I had, you know, <coughs> excuse me, friends that, you know, traveled to and from uh, Baltimore and D.C. weekly. So these, you know, these they were kind of getting to the point, too, where they were getting kind of, you know, anxious and stressed about going back and forth. And it was, there was, it was, it was really, you know, scary time. And, um, and I think, you know, all of us in Maryland and Virginia kind of sighed with relief when, you know, they were caught. And, um... But yeah, it was just, it was, I can remember, you know, sitting, going to church and hearing about it at church and then, you know, eventually watching it on the news and seeing, you know, this 17 year old kid and this man and it was just, it was just crazy. So that's why, one reason why I picked it or the only reason I picked it, sorry, so I hope everyone enjoyed and I hope everyone has a great week and thank you for watching and I will see you all next time.